Thank you, Daniel. Um, we found out yesterday that uh, the previous uh, three speakers have actually managed to knock a fair portion of my presentation out, so we'll go through this one reasonably quickly. Um, in terms of a summary of, of where we're at with Mahengi, um, we still have 100% of the project. Uh, obviously, we know as we go into uh, development, the government gets a, a portion of free carried interest, but at the moment we own the project, so uh, that's in a good position to be in. In terms of the pre-fees, we've really uh, come up and, and come up for long life mine at meaningful scale, and that's really important in terms of your offtake because if you're going to be uh, buying our graphite, you need to modify your manufacturing process to use the graphite. So the one thing you want to be doing is finding, can you produce more of the material and can you produce uh, a, over a long life? And, and that's a key, key barrier to entry. We think the capex is, is modest at, at 90 million. Um, and where we're going with the DFS, we're getting more and more confident that it's going to be on uh, the right side of 90 million. Um, it's a crawl walk run strategy. We build one module. It produces 80,000 tonne of product or a million tonne throughput. Cash flow funds a second and a third module. In effect, that puts us in charge of when we make those capital decisions and when the market timing is right. So we don't end up overcapitalizing the project too quickly. It is low OPEX. We are at the bottom of the cost curve uh, in the lower quartile, but importantly, because of the flake distribution, we're at one of the top ends of the margin curve. And uh, this is a little bit like iron ore. You've got fines and you've got lump. Graphite's no different in that regard. You have fines and you have flake. We fortunately have a, a flake distribution. And the financial metrics, um, you know, 900 million, over 900 million NPV US using uh, a fairly credible price deck. Uh, and it is inclusive of a 16% government free carry. So, uh, at the moment, that's a, a 10 to 1 capital to NPV ratio, which is a, a stunning metric for any project. We think we've got uh, the best graphite uh, available, and I think we've proven that a number of times with both extended battery testing, having done all the expanded work, and, and certainly having proved it's durable by running it through the pilot plant and generating 99% off, off a flotation concentrate. It is simple. You've heard uh, Andrew talk about uh, our material. You've heard Daniel talk about our material. This is a very small, simple, easy to run plant. Uh, what that means is operability in the field is probably going to be one of the best plants in the graphite, uh, in certainly in East African graphite, to run. It's going to be simple. In terms of management capability between uh, Richard and myself, I think we, uh, we both carry enough scar tissue to matter to have learnt what to do and what not to do. And uh, I think we've got a reasonable management capacity in that regard. And, and really, you know, where we're going with the path to market, we've got real partners with uh, MIWA. We're certainly talking to a few people in Korea and China at the moment. But we're sort of being pretty selective. We're, we're not trying to push into anybody. We want partners who are going to be credible, who are going to go with us with the whole journey. And I think, as I'll, I'll touch on the, uh, the graphite market a little bit later on, but there's some interesting dynamics going on in the market that uh, you need to think about to put this whole thing into context. <coughs> Corporate overview. Um, everybody probably gets that. So a little bit about where we're at. I said it's a crawl, walk, run strategy. We start small. We start modest. 80,000 tonnes cash flow f ourselves through two stages to 250,000 tonnes. That throws off just north of $220 million EBIT um, when we hit uh, things in, in full cash flow. So that's a, that's a lot of money. Steady state OPEX, uh, 378 a tonne. Uh, again, that's looking a lot better now that we're in the DFS. Assumed feed grade of 8.5%, uh, low strip ratio. It gives us a, a really important concept that I use is what I call the absolute strip ratio. And that is how many tonnes of rock do you need to move for a tonne of product? Um, so you take a high grade, low strip ratio, good recovery. We're moving around about 16 to 18 tonnes of rock for a tonne of product. If you start looking at some lower grade projects, they're moving into a, something in the order of 50 tonnes of rock for a tonne of product. And, and sorry, moving rock costs money. There's no other way to, to address that. So fundamentally, a very strong competitive position that can't be eroded. Probably the best way to look at competitive position is if you look at the price deck. We're using 1241. Um, 
that's still a, a, a valid price deck, but you can sort of take it two ways. If the energy minerals thematic takes off, everybody goes to sort of things we, we, we're talking about, some of the bullish forecasts, we're off to voracious. It's as simple as that. The other way, if it uh, goes a little bit slow and we do end up competing for HB pencils, um, we go down $400 a tonne on the price deck, we're still making about four times our initial capital investment as an NPV. That's still a compelling investment proposition. And, and again, I'd turn around and say, if you are looking at other graphite stocks, try run 841 through their price deck and see where you end up. Um, I think we've got a, got a very compelling case there. The final thing that's really important here is, is where we are. That's, uh, that's the project area, but uh, we're just on the edge there of a little town called Ifakara, and that's on the Tanzania Zambia Railway Authority. That gives us great access to infrastructure. We can send a train straight from Ifakara to the wharf at Dar es Salaam, uh, which is a deep water port, so there's plenty of sailings of, of good ships to, to final markets. And, and the other thing is we have a 220 kV bus bar sitting in Ifakara that we can connect the project in on the national grid. So we're coming in on grid power with great transport connections. In terms of the PFS, there's a, there's a number of ways you can look at how you, you look at a competitive project. Um, capital intensity, which is simply what's the investment capital divided by your final run rate. Uh, if I do that across all projects and where people have used a stage strategy, I've used their stage strategy in comparison, but quite simply, we've got the best bang for buck in terms of your initial investment. Probably a more compelling way to look at it is start to turn around and say, what does it do for your margin? Now, in the margin calculation here, I used our price deck against everybody else's projects. So it's wrong, but it's uniformly wrong. So it's a like-by-like -like comparison. So if you turn around and say, what's the margin? In our case, a bit over $800 a tonne and a capital intensity of $300 a tonne puts us in the right spot of the competitive landscape of where you want to be. And clearly, you know, there are some other projects, and that's CIRA by, everybody can tell by the size of the blob. The blob reflects the size of the ore reserve. You can see that uh, the project is, is very, very competitive. We've talked about our, uh, the, the, the concentrate that we've produced, but I think the, the real message coming out of this one is that we took 97.5 in a closed circuit. We reprocessed it through the polishing circuit. We turned it into 99% and you cannot buy 99% flotation concentrate on the market at the moment, it just doesn't exist. If you want 99%, it's chemically refined. But we've turned that in there and we still have a meaningful flake distribution in on that. So that's a completely new product It talks about how strong the material is, how competitive it is, and importantly, it gives us a lot of, uh, comp gives us a lot of confidence that some of the, the more advanced applications, such as batteries, this stuff is going to outperform anything that's ever been seen before. So we just look into that one polishing mill. Uh, it's effectively, what we did for the 99% is we simply took this step here, took 200 kilos out and reprocessed it through that part of the pilot plant to see what we got, and that's where we got the 99%. And the, the only, you know, the, the only way you can do that is, is just normally you'd be polishing, 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 polishing and turn that into bug dust. Now, the 99% or 97.5% is an important point to take away because if you look at CIRA in their quarterly um, and in their phone hookup a couple of weeks ago, they're putting in a second set of attritioning circuits to try to take their product to 97.5. So again, the the market leader or the 900 pound gorilla in this space is validating our position that purity does matter and purity will attract a premium in the final offtake markets. The, the other thing that's really important in terms of flexibility of the mill that we're building is all we need to do is simply increase retention time in that polishing circuit and we can produce 99% off the mill that we do at the moment but we do have to throttle tons back a bit. So where we're at at the moment, execution, uh, we're focusing on, on really getting construction ready. So uh, process a bunch of stuff happening at the moment. The environmental impact statement has gone back in um, following government review. We're expecting uh, a fairly prompt response to that. We've answered all the questions that they've asked. 
We've commenced the resettlement framework analysis, so uh, setting that up so we can have a smooth transition onto site access. Uh, and obviously having product is allowing for some meaningful engagement with customers. And it's really, really important because we engaging with our customers, we'll have another 40 tonnes of product in uh, August, September, which allows us to convert a lot of interest into really robust offtake agreements. Towards the end of the year, DFS completed, uh, feed will be in, commenced, and you know we're pretty confident we're going to get the mining licence awarded. Uh, the window's open and they're, they're taking applications and mining licences and certainly we've engaged with the government to, to continue that process. Come Christmas, we want to be shovel ready, really coming into construction at the start of calendar year 19, with around about a 12 month construction period commissioning at the end of calendar year 19, early 19, uh, 2020. In terms of offtake and, and where we're at in the market, um, we're working with MIWA, we're working with a bunch of other people, but uh, MIWA we can talk about because we have an MOU signed with them. That's Mitsubishi. This is not a, um, a, a Chinese takeaway. This is a high quality uh, Western customer who is a participant in the market at the moment. So these guys know what good looks like um, and are very, very keen to, to, to engage with the relationship and take it further. There's a lot of talk in the, in the sector about people wanting to get into spheronising and battery feeding and all this stuff. Um, I think it, to be successful in, in any mine you only need three things and that's focus, focus and focus. And trying to be all things to everyone is strategic distraction. So we recognise some people will want to buy spheronised graphite from us. So what we've done is we've developed a channel to market to allow us to fill that desire for spheronised graphite but not having to take our eyes off the main game of running a mine. And that's where Botian come in. Botian are an existing player in that spherical market and can do that on a contract basis for us. Finally, we've really put our money where our mouth is. We've done 300 cycle battery testing um, and at 300 cycles the batteries outperformed what we could see on the commercial market. 300 cycles is important because it really talks about a two year contract on your phone and charging it every second day. So it's an important milestone for consumer products. Demand's an interesting one. Um, so we've got predominantly got a flake type deposit, so uh, the expanded market is of more interest to us than the EV market, but you can turn big flake into fines, you can't turn fines into big flake. So a little bit about the, the EV market, and I've seen this sort of graph about three or four times in the last month or two. And, and this is from Ray Willis, he gave a presentation at the Battery Minerals Conference in Perth. And, and what Ray's contention was, was that at the moment there's a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot of talk and there's some pretty good excitement in the market, in the energy minerals market, at this stage of the cycle. Now, if we end up with a very large scale fleet conversion over to EVs, we're just at the start of this thing. You can imagine what the uh, material demand and the uh, sort of new mine development we're going to need as we convert most of that vehicle fleet over. The important point about graphite is you can recycle lithium, cobalt and nickel out of a lithium ion battery. You can't recycle the graphite because the graphite degrades. So while we're looking at this conversion, what it's talking for graphite is a steady state demand as opposed to something you can recycle. The other really important bit about this is the key competitor to natural flake graphite and lithium ion battery is synthetic graphite. And if you're seeing a, a large scale switch out from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, uh, you can draw your own conclusions to the price and availability of synthetic graphite. <coughs> so the other dynamic that's really important is that the traditional supply source of, of natural flake graphite has been China um, and, and those mines tend to be fragmented and they tend to be reasonably small discrete entities which means the, the capacity to that mine to scale up and produce large volumes of material of homogenous feedstock for a EV manufacturer is limited. So the, the generation of the East African mines which are, are significantly larger and have a capacity to expand production to produce a, a significant volume of product 
is a change in the industry and it's really talking about consolidating that supply chain. It's a little bit like what we've seen in the iron ore business over the last 20 years. How does that talk to in terms of prices? If we look at this price series and we extended it to the left a little bit, you'd see quite a significant peak here. And that's really associated with the steel boom that went on in China. We've seen the same thing over here in Australia in the iron ore prices. They peaked, they came off as the, the steel volumes decreased. But we're starting to see at the end here some upward trend as a, as a consequence of actually the, the EV pickup and supply chain constraints in China. The Chinese have helped us a little bit. They shut down a lot of mines that were, we'll call it, environmentally challenged. Uh, and some of those have come back, but a number of them remain closed. So there's a, a fair change in that, in that sector. The, the important point about the Chinese industry is it tends to produce a lot of fines. Uh, so you can think about Syria and China having an arm wrestle. We're in the flake market. We're in a different position in the value curve to, to Syria and China. Uh, you can see benchmarks price forecasts there, 99.95 at 15 microns, $3,100 a tonne. Um, well, we're only 0.5% off that, so um, we're getting pretty good to some, some potentially interesting prices. The other probably one that's worth talking about is the geopolitical tensions tying up with uh, how that goes into resource ownership and uh, if you look at what's coming out of the EU at the moment in terms of strategic minerals, they actually rate graphite as a higher risk of strategic control than say a resource such as cobalt. And we've certainly seen what's happened in the cobalt market of late. So if I pack and wrap that, talk about uh, BlackRock ourselves. Why BlackRock? Look, we've been delivering, we've just been steadily working on the project. We've come out of a uh, PFS. We've drilled out the, uh, the metallurgical drill sample. We took a 500 tonne sample, which is probably best described as we took 20, 25 tonne samples because we did the sampling variability properly. We put it on a train to demonstrate that we can A, engage with the government, B, have a viable logistics route. We've done the pilot plant. Uh, we think that significantly de-risks the project Importantly, it significantly de-risks market offtake. We have real product that lets us talk to real customers to produce real relationships. We're doing a DFS. We're not going to build this thing off a of PFS. We're doing a DFS because we want to be able to turn that plant on, have it ramp up very quickly and produce the product that we designed it for. And in terms of where we are in the market, we're dealing with customers uh, we can put real product in front of the customers and form a relationship based on, on a known deliverable. And that comes back to the point where we are. We have spec sheets, we have 45 element ICP analysis. All our product at the moment in terms of our specification is indistinguishable to the sort of commercial documentation that you would see, receive from an established graphite producer. So that's BlackRock in a, in a summary. That's uh, where we're at. I'd uh, now invite Richard to step up and uh, do a Q&A session, please. Richard, thank you.